from you trying to play, Huntley. Who the hell was that guy talking? Nice work, Hunley. That really worked. Wow. <laughs> okay, everybody. This is uh, Mark Robert 24 years ago. <laughs> wow. I think that was the year 2000 or something or 99. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But um, everybody wanted to um, work out how the poll worked. And somebody pointed out that the money won. And yes, it did. And Sharon Drury's coming in strong. Oh, way to go, Sharon. Getting your wishes here, you know. Thank you so much. Yep. Well, it was closer than we thought it was going to be with the Baldwin. The fact That's that he true. even, that there was a five in front of that number was remarkable that uh, instead of like six, seven, we figured it'd be like 70, 80%, but it was that close. It we, was that close. Yeah. yeah. It was like 53 or 54% for Baldwin, which means, I mean, 45% for uh, Abby. Oh, hell. Uh, well, let me, think? let me explain that. Uh, that video there because some people may not understand yeah. what it was the, the first video is very rare footage as I, I asked eric to put it up it is actually the mc5 the only group that had the nerve to show up at the chicago convention for the so-called festival of life that turned into a lot of head bashing but there was a flatbed truck and that's wayne kramer you see playing kick out the jams mfr um and the crowd dancing going crazy with a montage but that's extremely rare footage and the reason i showed the footage after that is that was my band in hollywood doing a thing called welcome to america abby hoffman and the guitar player in my band was wayne kramer from the mc5 and that little piece of audio that we'll get into a little later was abby hoffman at woodstock uh on the stage interrupting Pete Townsend from The Who <laughs> in, in regards to a guy who was in jail for two joints for 10 years named John Sinclair, who was the manager of the MC5 and the head of the White Panther Party, uh, which was the uh, white middle class version of the Black Panther Party out of Ann Arbor, Michigan in the 60s. The MC5 is a very political band and as was John Sinclair. So just to explain that, that was uh, a band I had called Mark Robert and the Blues Pros um, with a guy on, on harmonica named David Sheffield, brilliant harp player from Mississippi, who wrote all the Eddie Murphy SNL sketches and all the Eddie Murphy movies, very close friend of mine, but a, a fantastic harmonica player, by the way. Yeah, he sounds that way. Yeah. I mean, good Lord. So, uh, of course, um, <clears throat> Forrest Gump, Mark, uh, in the middle of everything. And yes, I will steal your comment. For <laughs> sure. Thank you so much, Lou. Thank you. Yeah, money on the stock exchange floor. 
And I will steal this chat too. Hey, oh, you well, know what? Okay. Yeah, it there keeps rolling at us. We'll steal yeah. it all evening, yeah, yeah. folks. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. I mean, money comes into play in a lot of the Abby story because uh, we'll, we'll go back for a second, but he there will be a stunt in the story where he goes to the uh, the stock exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, and money's involved at the New York Stock Exchange. Let me just put it that way. Yeah. Now, in, in fairness, I will say that um, he may be critical and not like money. Mark and I are absolute sellouts. So what? we're ready to keep That's the money joke. coming in. Or, or just, you know, it, you can always PayPal me directly. Wait a minute, Hunley. That's a cheap <laughs> shot. That's a cheap shot. You guys know uh, my PayPal address, right? Okay. <laughs> so don't, don't even worry about it. Be happy again. And so, all right. Um, right. this is going to be, um, there's a, big a, a long story. one. So, yeah, there's a big one. This, this guy had a big life and, um, it's a big story. He was a big guy and, and it crosses over many generations. Like Eric was pointing out, um, he's, he's born and raised in Worcester, Massachusetts in the fifties. And the only other famous person ever to come out of Worcester was a guy named Jack Kerouac. The second famous person is Abby Hoffman, which is really bizarre that it comes out of this little blue collar working class town in Massachusetts. But hey, uh, stranger things have happened. For sure. So, OK, start on Wor Wor nah, Worcester or whatever. Worcester. Well, it's called Worcester. It's, it's spelled Worcester, Worcester, but it's pronounced Worcester. It's, okay. it's, it's pronounced Worcester. <laughs> it, it just is. I, there's no way around it. So, you know. Okay. Um, so tell us a story. I know. I mean, there's so much going here. I'm, I'm totally like, right, there's a lot of video it. and multimedia stuff, which I kind of like See. About was multimedia, but you know, he was a greaser just so you know what a greaser was. Um, he was a, a Jewish kid who wore leather jackets and shot pool and stuff to that, uh, extent in the fifties, which a lot of kids did. Um, like James like, Dean, um, emulating right? James yeah. Dean, you know, there seems to be a bunch of these uh, Jewish kids who like that um, persona. And I could say Henry Winkler as the Fonz, Fonz or, sure. or, or, or Andrew Silverstein, who became Andrew Dice Clay, um, Abby Hoffman, who uh, also emulated this greaser character. Um, but what I'm saying is that that was what was in vogue at the time. And he got kicked out of school, things of that nature. But he eventually graduates uh, high school, the Worcester Academy, and goes to Brandeis University. It's a, a very pre prestigious university where he start, studies under uh, Abraham Maslow and gets a, a BA in- As in hierarchy of needs? Yes, yes, that was his mentor. And he gets a BA in psychology. He gets a master's at Berkeley in psychology. And uh, he works at a, um, a mental institution for a while having uh having softball teams that are schizophrenic and um <laughs> you know <laughs> he had the bedwetters versus the kleptomaniacs at one time two different teams <laughs> playing each other okay yeah one of them stole home literally there was no base there for them to slide into you know um <laughs> hey thanks dan Thank the you. uh anyway so he he when he was at brandeis he was actually um a uh, extremely talented tennis player and was hmm. thinking of turning pro. Um, he was a wrestler, a very athletic kid. Uh, also, he was a hustler. And, um, uh, you know, he was a guy who created trouble. He was a tumbler, as they say in Yiddish. Um, but obviously street smart, had a sister and a brother. His father ran a pharmacy. His father tried to become a pharmacist a number of times, Russian immigrant, uh, Abby, I think, was was first generation. Um, his father failed the pharmacy test a num uh, numerous times and then simply opened up a medical supply uh, uh, a company, uh, hmm. a medical supply business in Worcester that supplied medical supplies in the region. So it did fairly well in terms of uh, as a uh, career in that regard. But, you know, it a lot of radicals slash revolutionaries and all that were pretty much middle class kids, weren't they? Or even up well, no, class he class. was working class. This is a working class family, but the other ones were upper class kids. If you look at Bill Ayers and and, and that group, their their parents were corporate heads. I think Ayers or Jeff Jones's father was the vice president of Con Edison. That group, the underground group, 
were much more upper class kids than than and as were others who were middle class. But Abby was pure was clearly a working class kid, and and it reflects his entire career because he's a street brawler. He gets into fights, gets arrested numerous times. He dukes it out with the cops. He he's in the middle of every single thing physically. Um, he lives in the Lower East Side when he's, he moves down to live in kind of poverty in the Lower East Side when he meets Anita. But he marries a woman named Sheila, and um, she's far more of an activist than he is and turns Abby on to a lot of political stuff. So Abby, in 1964, 65, goes down to Mississippi and mm. gets involved with uh, registering blacks, uh, African-Americans and uh, others to vote uh, down in Mississippi, gets his head broken down there, gets into various scuffles, uh, hides people in the back of his car, driving them through the woods. It, it becomes really hair raising what he's involved in in 1964. And Goes by the way, this guy, um, you know, has to be pretty tough because he's about five, 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 six tops. Yeah. Not not a big, giant hulking figure. No, but he was ripped, you know, like somebody we know. Yeah, like uh, Viva. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In every you know, way, size-wise, <laughs> ripped-wise. Look, they are spiritual twins. Yeah, there's very little David doubt going about more, it. more radical as we speak and right. looking more Abby-ish. Right, and, and believe me, Abby, you know, he said, they said, are you a Marxist? He said, yeah, Groucho Marx, not Karl Marx. <laughs> I mean, he, he was much more into comedy than he was into communist uh, politics. I mean, in fact, um, th there's a, a, a great scene, which we'll get to, when they, uh, there's a march on the Pentagon, uh, 200,000 people, and he gets arrested, of course, immediately, and he's thrown into a cage with a lot of other um, protesters inside of the police station. And maybe there's about 50 people in a cage. And he takes a white sheet off the bed and he puts it over his head like a Klansman, goes to the bars and says, you gotta get me out of here. It's filled with commies and Jews, get me <laughs> out of here. And they're all like looking at him like, what the F is this? So no matter what the situation was, he always found the humor to it. And that's why Abby was so beloved because he, he didn't really take anything seriously. Although he was a serious thinker in terms of sure. politics, his whole act was to be the Groucho Marx of the left. That it's was almost him. a jester, court jester. It's a Quite court jester, later. but also he, he had, a, you know, he was a great writer. He wrote a number of books. He wrote tons of articles. I mean, the guy was, uh, I mean, look, he had a master's degree in psychology. This was not, you know, some guy who fell out of the back of a truck. He obviously worked to get those degrees, you know, at Brandeis and Berkeley. Um, sure. But the reality of it is he moves to New York. He moves to the Lower East Side and becomes a community act. <laughs> it just cracks me up. He becomes a community organizer in the Lower East Side. And he becomes mm. friends with Captain Joe Fink, who's in charge of the Ninth Precinct, who loves him like a son, but completely disrupts the neighborhood all the time. And Abby would run into the ninth precinct and jump on top of the police desks, yelling about some incident that occurred of someone being arrested for pot or whatever. And Fink would have to deal with this guy. So oddly enough, Lindsay is the mayor of New York and they hire Abby Hoffman as a community advisor and put him on the payroll of the mayor's office in New York, hmm. which is which is really odd. But the idea was to have. You know, even today they do this, right? With gang members and various... Yeah, you can't control them, pay them. Right, right. You know, so, if, if they're working for you, you put them on payroll, then they've got to do it. A couple of uh, Super Chats come in looking very dapper. Agreed. Thank you. Thank Always you. This new, new suede jacket I'm wearing and, for the uh, first time. Uh, <laughs> bed weight is great again. Amber made bed popping great, too. Okay. The pooping, too, yes. Yeah. The um... <laughs> Amber turd. <laughs> anyway, so Abby would get involved and he he opens up a uh, free store and, and the free store has everything in it that's free. <laughs> so you go into this store, there's no prices on anything. And somebody says, how much is this? And they go, what do you think it's worth? And it, they say, I don't know, 75 cents. So you were directed to give the 75 cents to another customer who was in the store. There was no manager. It was called a free store. And they, <laughs> he would go around. I don't even know how to explain this. It, it sounds like a psychological experiment, actually. 
Well, it came from the diggers. It came from Emmett Grogan, and um, they believed everything was fr should be free. Uh, the diggers came out of San Francisco. Peter Coyote was a digger, the uh, famous actor. Uh, Peter Berg, who would uh, later start Fire Sign Theater, was a digger. Um, the diggers came out of the San Francisco mime troupe. All of these people came out of theater. That's why the, the whole counterculture, if you want to understand the counterculture in a short, brief lesson, it came out of the theater emerging from the theater into the streets. The reason everyone's wearing all those colorful outfits and those be-ins, a be-in was an extension of a theater piece. So mm. the, the Living Theater with Beck, at uh, Julian Beck and, and his wife, they had broken off the stage in the theater and gone into the audience. And that was the beginning of the Living Theater. And in my opinion, the beginning of the counterculture, because what spills out of the theater, they wanted to get rid of the stage and they would come off the stage, eliminate the stage and put, put their plays on in the middle of the audience. And so the audience would become part of the theater. That was their idea. Mm. That became the counterculture. The acid test with Kesey and the dead were extensions of living theater pieces in San Francisco. The same thing had happened in New York. Hmm. So when they had uh, these colorful events, they were merely also being theatrical like the performers were. That's where the Fire Sign Theater evolves from. That's where the San Francisco Mime Troupe comes from. That's where the diggers come from. And that was what Abby was into. But hmm. Abby is a little older than the other ones. So he opens in an episode on the diggers. Yeah, I'll get right on that. I got my hands full right now. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll do the diggers. But no, I mean, you're right. I mean, in theory, they should have their own episode. And Coyote was a leading force in, um, in the diggers. So was Emmett Grogan, who became a heroin addict and may or may not have raped Anita Hoffman. That's still a debate. But uh, Rogan wrote a great, Grogan, uh, wrote a great book called Ring Olivio, which I recommend uh, kind of autobiographical um, about him. But in the free store, they needed more stuff. So Abby and a guy would show up in a van at Klein's department store on 14th Street at 8 o'clock in the morning, dressed like workers with the names on their jackets with clipboards. And they go, we're here to pick up the TV. And, you know, it was a department store. So they'd go in and they'd read the um, serial number off the back of the biggest television they had at the time. Some admiral, huge furniture television set and tell the guy, we're here to pick this up. It's not working properly. The number is 9874BX37264. And the guy would look on the back. Oh, okay, you're right. And he, they'd pick up the TV, carry it out to the van, and Abby wrote him a receipt and gave the guy a receipt for the TV. And, and then they took it to the store and they left it there. And it's in the store for months. And nobody's picking up the free TV. They're all picking up pants and clothing and watches and jewelry for free. And nobody's taking this big TV because it was obviously too big to deal with. You know what I mean? It weighed like 300 pounds. Anyway, one day a cop comes in from the ninth precinct and he's on to them. He says, I'm here to pick up the TV. You want a receipt, schmuck? And he, they took the TV and they, they took it away. They weren't charged with anything because Abby said, I don't know, somebody donated it. But they had clear, the guy knew that they had stolen it. The cop probably home. took it home. Yeah, he no, he gave it back to Kleins and he comes back in to the store, the cop, and he goes to Abby, he goes, here's your receipt, asshole. And he gives him a receipt like he did in the crime. <laughs> and he said, that was pretty funny for a cop. You know what I mean? <laughs> Which the second uh, favorite joke he ever heard from a cop was they get arrested in Chicago and they were running a pig as president, Pegasus. And when they got arrested, they had the pig in back of the paddy wagon with them. And the pigs running around in the paddy wagon and they throw them all in jail. They took the pig. The police took the pig in Chicago to the ASPCA. So they were put in the jail in Chicago, which we'll get to in a second. But the pig is taken away and the cop comes to them while they're behind bars. And he goes, you guys are screwed. The pig squealed. <laughs> And he said that was the funniest joke he ever heard from a police officer in his life. <laughs> Deadpan. You guys are doomed. The pig squealed. <laughs> it's a good freaking joke, though. It's a great line. <laughs> ne never mind for a uh, cop. It's period funny. <laughs> right. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you that. So anyway, he uh, in 1965, they come back from Mississippi. 64, they have the uh, convention, the uh, Freedom Convention at Atlantic City. In 67, he um, gets involved with the 
politics um, that's happening in the country. And he he puts together a bee-in at Central Park. And in that bee-in, the bee-in that he arranges is his marriage to Anita Hoffman. And Time and Life magazine show up and they take some photos and they call them hippie couple gets married. I don't know if you have a copy of that photo. Um, yeah, hang on. Hippie you'll see. It's kind of interesting because there's a. it's one of the early bee-ins. And like I said, the bee-ins were these theatrical events that really spun out of the theater world. And that was their wedding in Central Park. Uh, right there, uh, third row down. Yeah, you know, it looks like him with the flowers in his hair. Yeah, there right? it is. Yeah, there it is. That's their wedding. Abby uh, with flowers in his hair. And, and Anita uh, in the white. Anita okay. Hoffman in the white outfit with sunglasses on. And uh, a lot of people showed up in Central Park for this wedding, which was a bee-in. And uh, later that year, they got some marijuana from a guy named Jimi Hendrix, who sent them a pound of marijuana for Valentine's Day for a stunt, <laughs> another, another media stunt. So they rolled up hundreds of joints in pink rolling paper and mailed it to all the TV and media people in New York City. <laughs> and I remember watching the guy on Channel 5 with the joint on TV saying, we got this for Valentine's Day. And they were pink joints that Abby and, and Anita had, and his friends had mailed out to the media for Valentine's Day. It was a very funny stunt. But he, he got involved in some other things. He... Um, to protest uh, the pollution from Con Edison, they had these two giant uh, smokestacks on 14th Street where the Con Edison uh, plant was. They went to Con Edison when the uh, workday was over and they put smudge pots and smoke bombs at the exit of Con Edison. And when the executives came out, they were in a sea of black smoke and, they were, and the people were taunting them saying, how do you like it? And it was really, the news covered it. I mean, it was really... He, he was able to come up with these incredible media stunts that allowed uh, a political message to get through from guerrilla theater, which was his whole thing. That's why the theater thing is so important, because the guerrilla theater, um, I saw Hennessy Orphea, maybe a girl came down on the stage and reached out. Right. Yeah, that was that was a kind of a commercial version of the living theater of Julian Beck and his wife. Uh, hair being that really a Broadway version of that at that point. Yeah, but that's a great example. Thank you again from the people of Scandinavia. <laughs> Thank you. The, so anyway, he begins to come up with these different stunts to attract media attention. And one of the, one of the stunts that they do is they get um, thousands of single dollar bills, right? And they go to the stock exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, and they, they're carrying a briefcase and it's got the thousands of single dollar bills in the briefcase, Eric. And they're stopped by a guard going, Hey, what is this? What are you doing? And he says, you got to let us in. And he goes, you're not getting in there. And they're, you know, cause look at the way they look. Right. So he says, you're not letting us in cause we're Jews. Right. And the guy goes, what? And <laughs> the guy freaks out and they let him in. He goes up to the, the balcony up there, you know, that overlooks the floor of the exchange. And they begin to cascade the money down onto the floor of the exchange, starting a riot of human flesh as the stockbrokers climb all over themselves in a <laughs> madhouse and proving their point that this was what was funding the war machine. And they literally trample themselves into unconsciousness, Eric. And mm. Abby and, and I think Ed Sanders was there, maybe Jerry Rubin, they run out of the stock exchange and the media has already pulled up the cameras because they told them that this was going to happen. So the camera trucks are pulling up from the local television stations and they, they're filming them on for local news. And Abby starts yelling, they're giving away free money in there. It's insane. You don't know. It's, you got to get in there. And so this story goes worldwide, Eric. That was one of the first and largest media pranks that Abby ever pulled off. And keep in mind, None of this stuff had ever happened before. This was a whole new ball game, and he was a kid of television and knew how to work this. He knew exactly what time to do it, when they were shooting, what slot it would fit on the evening news at seven twenty-six. And the, the psychology of what the psychology did. of it. He had studied McLuhan. He'd studied Maslow. He knew. He acted like an you know this jolly idiot, but he was behind that. He was a genius. 
You know what I mean? He knew the psychology of media inside and out. So this stunt, you know, really puts them on the map. And that leads eventually to, um, <laughs> I don't even know how to explain this one. This is really obscure. He comes up with a drug called Lace. It doesn't exist. It's a drug that um, is a combination of LSD and DMSO. And it doesn't exist. So he gets a disappearing ink. And they get like three couples of hippies in his apartment. And he assembles the media for this demonstration of this new love drug called Lace. Because we'd heard about Mace. This was Lace, Eric. And Lace, if you got it on you, would make you rip off your clothes and make love to the person with you. So you get so, some crazy hippies who will rip off their clothes and play it out. Exactly. That's what he does. And he <laughs> has the media show up in his apartment on the Lower East Side. He gets these three hippie, 20 year old hippie couples, and he sprays them with <laughs> lace, which is this disappearing purple ink. And they start ripping off their clothes. <laughs> And making love in front of the media. So he's saying, do you guys want to be squirted? And they're going, no, 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 no. And then he runs into the police station, again, Captain Fink on 9th Street, and he jumps up on the desk saying the same thing, and he squirts the lieutenant, and he says, now you're going to have sex with a sergeant. And he's yelling, get this off of me, Hoffman, get out of here. And they're trying to wash <laughs> off the lace so he doesn't have sex with a sergeant. I mean, Eric, I, I mean, some of this stuff, it would, if it was ever filmed, would have, would have killed, you know, oh my God. but yeah, imagine it's like a YouTube prank channel before any of this existed. Right. But there was a, a reason behind it all. And that was the politics of the time, you know, and, and um, it, it leads into probably the largest stunt he ever pulled off in his life. And that was on the uh, March on Washington, the first one, the March on the Pentagon. In, in 1967, 200,000 people, uh, the biggest BN they've ever assembled against the war. And Abby decided to levitate the Pentagon at that time. In a statement, he was going to levitate the Pentagon and have it uh, have these uh, spiritual uh, uh, witchcraft people shake out the demons from the Pentagon. So he goes to Washington weeks before Eric to measure how many people he's going to need to levitate the Pentagon. So he, he, he only have to measure one side. So it's him and another guy, and they just keep standing next to each other on one side of the Pentagon to see if they need like 300 people per side, right, <laughs> of human beings. So if somebody comes down and goes, what are you doing? And the guy goes, we're measuring the Pentagon. We're going to levitate it in two weeks. So they arrest him, right? And they go, for what? He goes, littering. And he goes, great. He loves being arrested. And they go, no, no, you got to get out of here. He goes, no, you got to charge me with littering. He, he refuses to go. And he's inside the Pentagon arrested for littering. But they do let him go. And at, when, the, when the protest comes, they've got Allen Ginsberg chanting. They've got all these different gurus with smoke and witchcraft and, and you know, chanting about the levigation of the Pentagon. But before that happens... He meets with Pentagon officials to discuss how high he'll be allowed to levitate the Pentagon. I swear to God, he has two meetings with Pentagon officials with a whole crew of people who are involved in the levitation. And he says on camera in the press conference, I'm going to levitate the Pentagon 23 feet in the air because the only ladder that will go 23 feet in the air is a fire engine ladder. Normal ladders won't go higher than 20 feet. So you won't be able to get out of the Pentagon once we levitate it that high. And he says, of course, there's going to be cracks in the foundation. There's going to be problems with plumbing. And they believe this. So they negotiate with him over the height. I swear to God, they negotiate with him over the height of the levitation. And they agree, agree on three feet. That's the, and they shake on it in the meeting. They shake on the three foot levitation. So this whole crew... This might be something about it here. I don't know which is this. Yep. yep. Yeah, let's see what he says here. Stupid than the war in Vietnam. But how do you cut through the clutter? This is what he and Jerry Rubin came up with. We're going to assemble a mass of holy men to surround the Pentagon. And they're going to surround it with chanting and love and drum beating. And the Pentagon is going to rise into the air on October 21st. 
And when it gets about 300 feet in the air, it's going to start to vibrate. Slowly at first, and then a little quicker. And all the evil spirits are going to pour out, falling all over Washington. The funny thing was, the Johnson administration took them seriously. Yeah. And yeah. he would um, be negotiating with government officials. So we want a permit. Okay, what's your permit to we want a permit to levitate the Pentagon 20 feet. No, we'll give you a permit 10 feet. <laughs> Some people still believe that Abby Hoffman levitated the Pentagon that day. <laughs> okay, well, that was my old friend Larry Ratso Sloman, by the way, who wrote um, Steal This Dream, one of the better books about, about Abby. Uh, Ratso was the editor of High Times and, of course, later the uh, executive editor of National Lampoon. Um, and... <laughs> Ratso knew Abby pretty well. The 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 levitation was probably one of the most covered stunts of the time. And I mean, a lot of people got arrested at that um, at that uh, protest. And that's where he did the thing with the Klan robe over his head, saying, "Let me out of here. There's commies and Jews in here." <laughs> I mean, I, I, you gotta love somebody who comes up with that. And the rest of the people were all depressed, and they're in the jail cell. You know, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna get bailed out of here? And here's this guy doing this Klan thing. I mean, that's kind of funny. But this all leads to. Um, okay. Well, I have more of more with him with Ratso. I don't know if you wanted to show that. Oh yeah, now what, what else you got with Ratso? What is this one? Let's see. Just a quick one. In the okay. previous year, Abby Hoffman had almost single-handedly turned a sober protest movement into a riot of high-minded political theater. Well, that was the pig, by the way. The beauty of that <laughs> is to be able to take these issues. More Ratso. Give them enough of a satirical spin to invite more people to the party. Abby's right. guerrilla campaign featured media savvy stunts that brought the stock exchange to a screeching halt uh, there we go. and turned there the Pentagon is. into an evil religious symbol. He did it in a way that was funny, yet, you know, serious at the same time. Political pigs, your days are numbered. We are the second American revolution. We are winning. Yippee. <laughs> yeah, that it, actually, there was footage there of him burning money when they came out of the stock exchange. They started to burn some money and they said they're inside destroying all money and giving it away. You better get in there. And they lit some money on fire and the media just went crazy. That was from the uh, stock exchange. Mm. And the reason that there's plexiglass today on the stock exchange balcony is because mm. of Abby Hoffman throwing the money off of the stock exchange. Balcony. Oh, really? That's why yeah. there's plexiglass because of that <laughs> event. They had to stop others from. Th yeah, the Q Shaman. Looked I, I, at one point, I put up um, a photo of the Q shaman alongside uh, Jerry Rubin with war paint on Rubin. And I said he was the right he was the right uh, version of Jerry Rubin, you know, the shaman. Uh, very similar look. Well, and that's why we're covering this stuff now, too. It's, yeah. it, it's reflective. Of, I yep. mean, yep. W weren't they protesting a war in a country that most people couldn't pin on a map? Sounds familiar. Well, yeah. yeah, there's something going on with the country that most people can't pin on a map going yeah, on. You know, yeah. hmm. Anyway, well, I mean, the 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 situation leads to the demonstration in Chicago, and the demonstration in Chicago. Keep in mind, is the Democratic convention in Chicago, not the Republican convention. Uh, this is the Democratic convention in Chicago, mm -hmm. and MLK had been killed, RFK had been killed. Uh, LBJ said, I'm not going to run again. This is a wide open situation in Chicago. So they begin to try to plan to have this demonstration. And Mayor Daly says, you're not getting a permit to march here over my dead body. So Abby jokingly, of course, in these press conferences, says we're going to dose the water supply with one million hits of LSD. One million people <laughs> will be on acid in Chicago. And they come in and they meet with the deputy mayor. And he says, please don't put acid in the water. And he says, OK, how much are you willing to pay me? <laughs> he says, how much are you willing to pay me? So he says, um, sorry, the acid made me pull this one up. Yeah. The um, pro mushroom QAnon <laughs> shaman. Probably. Probably. He offers um, the deputy mayor offers Abby one hundred thousand dollars not to put um, <laughs> acid in the reservoir. So uh, that comes up later in the Chicago seven trial that they seriously were trying to extort a bribe from the mayor's office when it obviously it was a joke. You know what I mean? That he was, uh, the whole thing was a joke. And, you know, the FBI is all over them and every everything is supposed to uh, happen in August. 
But because of the fear of violence, all these bands canceled, which is what the opening was about, that opening footage. The only band that had the chutzpah to show up was the Motor City Five, which was a working class band out of Detroit. Um, and a progenitor months. of punk, if I recall. Absolutely. I mean, before the MC5, there's nothing. MC5, before Iggy's, before the Stooges. I mean, a lot of stuff comes, like Iggy comes out of Detroit. But yeah, I mean, they were the, considered to be the first punk band of the, the inventors of punk in a way. I mean, Wayne will later go on to do prison time in Kentucky for heroin, where he forms a band in prison with Red Rodney, the trumpet player for for Charlie Parker, a completely separate side story, but he'll come out and then play with Johnny Thunders. And I mean, Wayne's a rock and roll legend without a doubt. I mean, it was an honor to be in a band with Wayne Kramer. I mean, that's insane. Um, but the point of the matter is the only band that shows up is the MC five and everybody's expecting a riot. There was supposed to be a hundred thousand people. It turns out to be 10,000 people and they've got 15,000 to 20,000 cops and military guys, Eric. So it's almost like, one cop for every person or two cops for every person, you know, in terms of protesters. And um, as expected, things went south. <laughs> was this part of it? That's for, That was from the Pentagon. Now, that's an interesting thing. That was from the, uh, uh, the anti-war uh, march on Washington. And okay. that guy, that's a very famous Pulitzer Prize winning photo of a guy putting the daisies in the uh, rifle barrel. Uh, no one had ever done that before. <laughs> that was a pretty, pretty bold thing to do. Now, that guy was known as Super Joel, and he was a friend of Abby's, a very famous guy that everybody knew from the Lower East Side. Super Joel was a multimillionaire, uh, flew in his own private jet. And at the time? At the time, yes, <laughs> yes, right now, at the time. So much for a street kid. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, Super Joel was not a street kid. Super Joel was a major narcotics traf trafficker and acid dealer ah. and a uh, multimillionaire. And the photograph was taken by a very famous photographer named Rosenthal, who took the photo of the flag uh, at Iwo Jima. And mm. he worked for Time or Life or one or the other. But this became an iconic photo. It's just interesting that nobody knows who that is. And that's Super Joel, my friend, for your dot people out there in dot lands. You could take that one home. Uh, nobody's going to, nobody's going to figure that out. But anyway, so he comes with Abby from New York and, um, the Chicago convention is, um, the following year in 68 in August and, and the chaos ensues. Abby's being followed around by FBI agents and he finally to get arrested. He writes F U C K on his forehead and gets arrested while eating in a restaurant. <laughs> He's trying to get arrested and they finally acknowledge that he's doing that and they arrest him and um, take him to jail and he is then bailed out. But the rest of them, you know, they get their heads broken open. Rennie Davis gets his head broken open. Uh, uh, Tom Hayden gets arrested. Uh, Ruben has a um, uh, undercover agent on him as a bodyguard. They, they said this guy was a biker. A guy named Bob Pearson was a Chicago undercover uh, police officer who posed as a biker and said, I'll be your bodyguard for the entire uh, event. And they mm. stupidly agreed to this. And in fact, when Bobby Seale arrives at the airport, the head of the Black Panther Party, Pearson, as a provocateur, like in Michigan with Governor Whitmer, like January 6th, says, why don't we have Bobby Seale speak at the rally? And then Bobby Seale is later arrested and becomes part of the Chicago 7, essentially the Chicago 8, with Bobby Seale. And that's his crime, which was provoked by Bob Pearson of Chicago police, just mm. as a provocateur. So you can see how effective being a provocateur might be when you have political uh, situations like Governor Whitmer in Michigan or January 6th. This is an old, old trick uh, by intelligence services within police agencies who are usually linked to um, it's been going on forever. local police. I, I, you know, I put up um, on locals, if you guys want to look at it, Abby's police, a Abby's FBI file, uh, which we received during the Freedom of Information Act, 13,000 some odd pages long. And, <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, but here's the plot twist. I was working with Ratso at Lampoon and Ratso, uh, try to get the um, the Freedom of Information Act 
to get the files. And Ratso did get the files. And they said it's a uh, 50 cents a page. Oh, yeah, that's an old trick uh, to get the... Right. Uh, Ratso went to court and won in court to get that uh, eliminated. That oh. was That's what Ratso did because he needed the files for his book. And tip of the hat to Ratso for, for getting that done because that was an old trick to prevent you from getting it. And uh, that finally came to an end. So I put up the 13,000 pages on Locals uh, the other day if people want to have a look at it. Wow. It's up there, yeah. Uh, Unstructured.locals.com. Right. Yeah. How you get there, I don't know. You take the uh, 101 to the 5, you get off at uh, Vanderbilt Avenue and you make a right. So also I put up the transcripts from the Chicago 7 trial, um, especially Abby's testimony, which I thought was, <laughs> you know, I was telling Eric about the movie the other day, the one that um, Aaron Sorkin did, this political hack job. And um, they change a lot of the facts in the movie. There's a great one by Brett Morgan called The Chicago 10. There's another great one by Jeremy Kagan called The Chicago 7. The movie's been made repeatedly and often and has been done. We did not need Sasha Baron Cohen, six foot 11, playing Abby Hoffman at 5'7". Uh, <laughs> the only thing they had in common was probably their, their, their religion. Um, and his accent is all over the map, blah, blah, blah. It's really, you know, it's a piece of work. But Sorkin changes a lot of the factual information, including the actual transcripts of the case. It was a play off Broadway. I mean, the, the, the whole beauty of doing the Chicago 7 as a play or a, or a movie was to use the actual factual court transcripts, which are art in themselves. They are wonderful. What goes on in this case is so insane that you do not need Aaron Sorkin to rewrite the court transcripts. But as Eric brilliantly pointed out, that it may be Sorkin's ego that the writing in the court transcripts might be better than his. So he had to change it. I never thought of that. And tip of the hat to Hunley for coming up with that, because it's probably true. Abby Hoffman takes the stand in his own defense. And what he improvisationally says is better than anything that Abby that, that Aaron Sorkin could have ever written. Now, in a second, we'll get to that. But just to digress, there was a judge in the case named, oddly enough, Judge Julius Hoffman. Judge Julius Hoffman was 75 years old. He was cantankerous. He was funny. He was nasty. He hated these guys. He was in shock that they were doing these, these in, insane things in his courtroom. Um, at one point, as indicated, Abby and Jerry showed up. The trial went on for weeks and weeks in, in, in judges' robes. They showed up in judges' robes. And Hoffman says, what are you wearing there? Are those judges' robes? And he says, yes. And he says, well, take those off. So they unzip the judges' robes. And underneath, they're wearing Chicago police uniforms. <laughs> underneath the judges' robes to make it even worse. So, I, I, I mean, these stunts were insane what they were doing in the court. But the, the ultimate situation was the fact, just to get into the, the legal nuance of the case, which uh, uh, Barnes and Viva might want to discuss with us someday if we ever find these guys. Uh, they, <laughs> they, they would not give uh, uh, Bobby Seal uh, representation. He had a lawyer named Charles Gary, who was an ACLU attorney and was famous for representing uh, political uh, uh, dissidents. Charles Gary was in the hospital having a gallbladder operation. So Bobby Seale didn't have an attorney. And he was dragged in on that speech thing that I told you about that was provoked by the uh, Chicago police. So Bobby Seale is sitting there and he has no attorney. So Judge Julius Hoffman says, well, Kunstler could be your attorney, <laughs> William Kunstler. He goes, I don't want William Kunstler. And he goes, well, he's a pretty good attorney. Why don't you just take Kunstler? And Seal just says, what are you talking about? I, don't, I want my attorney, Charles Gary. That's my choice as an American. So Hoffman, Judge Hoffman says, I don't care about that. What's the difference? <laughs> you guys are the same. Just use Kunstler. He's got a big mouth. Use him or this other guy who's over here. So <laughs> he doesn't shut up, Bobby Seal, about this. And rightfully so, because he has no attorney. And, and Kunstler says, I am not his attorney, Your Honor. And Kunstler is cited, I think, with 100, everybody was cited with 175 uh, counts of contempt of court. 
in the course of the <laughs> trial, 175. They were sentenced to four or five years individually just on contempt of court charges from the bench. I mean, it, it, it was a total circus. And like I said to you the other night, they had discussed coming in like regular defendants in suits and ties. And they said, Abby told them, no way, we're coming in as countercultural freaks dressed in their regular clothes, which is what they did to the horror of Judge Hoffman, who in his 50 years in Chicago in, in the federal court system had never seen this, Eric. You know what I mean? Like, it's just not done. Yeah, it's a generational collision from hell. Well, look at even in the Johnny Depp case. I mean, look at all the cases we see today. Nobody comes in in civilian clothes. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, it could be contempt of court by itself, right? Well, I would argue that his actions literally were contempt. I mean, right. I mean, he was showing his contempt of the system. Right. So it's kind of a funny one because it is the definition of contempt right. of court. Right. But right. do we have that right? Because wasn't he expressing himself in that, that we have free speech and we have a right to show contempt of court? Or am I misinterpreting? No, no, you're not. But I mean, from Bobby Seale's point of view, he has the right to an attorney. I mean, that's for sure. sure. And, and sure. nobody can assign you an attorney you don't want. That was brought up by Kunstler also in the transcripts. And and um, anyway, so he won't shut up. And every time is he, he, I mean, he doesn't talk all the time, but when his name comes up, he goes crazy, right? Because he has nobody defending him. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so he, what, what Judge Hoffman does is he has the marshals drag him out and they bring him back in, bound and gagged to the metal chair. Now he's sitting there in the metal chair, bound and gagged, but it's kind of loosely done. So he, he, he says to him, Hoffman, yeah, Hoffman says, uh, uh, Julius Hoffman. By the way, Abby Hoffman is yelling, you're my father throughout the trial. You're my father. Where's my, why didn't you, why did you leave my mother? How dare you, dad? And he's going, shut up. I'm not your father. I'm not your father. He's like screaming at Abby Hoffman. And, and, and Julius Hoffman is yelling at Bobby Seal. And then he, kind of tones it down and says, Mr. Seal, if you're willing to calm down and just sit here, I will have the marshals um, remove your gag. So they remove the gag and he just starts screaming and yelling again. They take him out, they bring him back, and now he's got the gag around the top of his head, across the side, and he's manacled with his feet and his arms to the chair. He's got manacles uh, uh, on both his hands and feet and he sat, one woman in the jury started sobbing uncontrollably. That's how dramatic this was. This was a jury woman. She starts sobbing. He sat in that chair, not patiently yelling through the muffled gag and rattling the chains for five days. Five days of testimony. Bobby Seale was chained to that chair and gagged in an American federal courtroom. And that is what happened in, in the Chicago trial of, of the Chicago 7 there being uh, eventually eight, meaning Bobby Seal. People don't realize, and this is not covered by Sorkin, who merely brushes over it, but Abby went crazy. They all going crazy. The marshals get into a fist fight. They drag Dellinger out. David Dellinger, an older man, had been in charge of uh, the anti-war mobilization um, known as the MOB. Dellinger is uh, in, dragged out and put in the jail in the courthouse and Abby is pummeled underneath the desk when he's trying to stop the marshal. So this is physically going on in the courtroom. These beatings are happening in the courtroom. And Jeez. when the day is over, the defendants would fly to various cities. They'd be taken right to the airport and go speak at universities to raise money for their defense. So Abby would be on a jet to LAX and he would go speak at, at, at a college and raise money for their defense and then fly back and be there in the morning. Two lawyers showed up late for court one morning and he put them in jail downstairs and they were in jail for three days. The two lawyers, this is what Hoffman did. He, the whole thing was later overturned on appeal saying the reason it was overturned was technically Hoffman, this is Julius Hoffman, the 75 year old. Yeah, start saying Judge Hoffman or something or <laughs> just to help right, us out. Right, yeah, it's a little confusing. <laughs> Judge Hoffman handpicked the jury without the lawyers question mm. he said you look pretty good what, what do you <laughs> you'd make a good juror he'd ask them a couple of questions and say okay <laughs> you're on the jury 
and that's how the jury, and that was what overturned it. They were, they were um, uh, not guilty of conspiracy. And Abby famously said, how could we be involved in a conspiracy? We can't even agree on lunch. <laughs> that was one of the lines that Abby came up with. And in truth, um, they were cited for a law that was passed the year before by Southern conservative Democrats called the HRAP Brown Law. And it was designed to stop interstate, uh, um, interstate crossing to incite a riot in the South. Hmm. And it was designed specifically for the civil rights movement. The law was, after the case was overturned, the law itself was overturned and eliminated from the books. It was passed in Congress by Southern Democrats, uh, mostly. And it was called the H. Rap Brown Law. Anyway, the case was eventually overturned on appeal, but they all did, you know, various incarceration periods, especially Bobby Steele. Um, so there were damages ensued there on these people for... Um, they were out on bail, essentially, but they had their bail revoked for acting out periodically in the case. Wow, crazy. I mean, it was a huge case. I mean, it, this was, you know, like the OJ case or Johnny, you know, it was like this was covered wall to wall by the media at the time. It was huge. It was huge. Speaking of acting out, is there something we're supposed to be doing or no? Oh, right. Yeah, maybe we could read. We'll just read the very beginning. If we, if, oh yeah, there's yours. Okay. Oh wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Let's hold see on. How, how's this working. If you have any uh, sort of judicial, um, if you could put your robe on, that right. might be helpful, Your Honor. We got to find our way into the mode of everything. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jesus! Didn't we do this, this once work? before, Hunley? All right. Well. Yeah, let's see. Right. Oh, yeah, that's that'll do it's it. It's in the spirit of it. That's <sighs> that'll do it. Man. Very good, Your Honor. That's very got to get in the spirit of everything here, right? We're we're serious thespians. Wait, wait, Mark. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. What do you got? Hold on. Okay. Let me, let me, I get fully into character. Okay, I got my gavel. Oh, that's brilliant, Hunley. I like this entire <laughs> thing. We're just gonna read a page. The introduction. This is Abby Hoffman taking the stand. He's cross-examined by one of the attorneys, uh, Wineglass. Um, and then you'll hear from Schultz, who is the assistant prosecutor, who played by Eric Hunley. Eric Hunley will be playing Judge Julius Hoffman in a dual role as assistant <laughs> federal prosecutor Schultz and as the 75-year-old aforementioned Julius Hoffman. I will be playing the part of Abby Hoffman and uh, Leonard Weinglass, the attorney uh uh, interviewing him. We don't have enough actors for this performance, so we're going to have to double up. And this is a brief uh, performance here. So Wineglass says, will you please identify yourself for the record? Uh, Abby, my name is Abby. I am an orphan of America. Your Honor, may the record show it is a defendant Hoffman who has taken the stand? Oh, yes, it may so indicate. Mr. Wineglass, where do you reside? Abby, I live in Woodstock Nation. Uh, Mr. Wineglass, will you tell the court and jury where it is? Abby, yes, it is a nation of alienated young people. We carry it around with us as a state of mind in the same way as the Sioux Indians carry the Sioux Nation around with them. It is a nation dedicated to cooperation versus competition, to the idea that people should have better means of exchange than property or money that there should be some other basis for human interaction. It is a nation dedicated to- Just where it is, that is all. <laughs> Abby, it is in my mind and in the minds of my brothers and sisters. It does not consist of property or material, but rather of ideas and certain values. We believe in a society- No, we want the place of residence. If he has one, place of doing business. If you have a business, nothing about philosophy or India, sir. Just where you live. If you have a place to live. Now, you said Woodstock. In which state is Woodstock? Abby, it, it, it is in the state of mind, in the mind of itself and my brothers and sisters. It is a conspiracy. Presently, the nation is held captive in the penitentiaries of, inst of the institutions of a decaying system. Mr. Wineglass, can you tell the court and jury your present age? Abby, my age is 33. I am a child of the 60s. Mr. Wineglass, when were you born? Abby, psychologically, 1960. Objection. If the court please, I move to strike the answer. 
What is the uh, wine glass? What is the actual date of your birth? Abby, November 30th, 1936. Wine glass. Between the date of your birth, November 30th, 1936, and May 1st, 1960, what if anything occurred in your life? Abby, nothing. I believe it is called an American education. Objection. I sustain the objection. Huh? Abby, could you tell the court and jury? His name isn't Abby. I object to this informality. Wine glass. Can you tell the court and jury what is your present occupation, Abby? Well, I'm a cultural revolutionary. Well, I am really a defendant full time. Wine glass. What do you mean the phrase cultural revolutionary, uh, Abby? Well, I suppose it is a person who tries to shape and participate in the values and the mores, the customs and the style of living of new people who eventually become inhabitants of a new nation and a new society through art and poetry, theater and music. Wine glass. What have you done yourself to participate in the revolution? Abby. Well, I've been a rock and roll singer. I'm a reporter with the Liberation News Service. I'm a poet. I'm a filmmaker. I made a movie called Yippies Tour Chicago, or How I Spent My Summer Vacation. Currently, I'm negotiating with United Artists and MGM to do a movie in Hollywood. I've written an extensive pamphlet on how to live free in New York. I've written two books, one called Revolution for the Hell of It, uh, under a pseudonym, free, and one called Woodstock Nation, wine glass. Taking you back to the spring of 1960, approximately May 1st, 1960, we tell the court and jury where you were. 1960? Uh, that's right. Uh, objection. I sustain the objection. Your Honor, the date has great relevance to the trial. May 1st, 1960 was the witness's first public demonstration. I am going to bring him down through Chicago. Not in my presence. You're not going to bring him down. I sustain the objection to the question. Abby, my background has nothing to do with my state of mind. Will you remain quiet while I'm making a ruling? I know you have no respect for me. Uh, Counselor, Your Honor, that is totally unwarranted. I think your remarks call for a motion for a mistrial. And your motion calls for a denial of the motion, Mr. Wineglass. Continue your... Continue with your examination. Counselor, you denied my motion. I haven't even started to argue my motion. I don't need any argument on that one. The witness turned his back on me while he was on the witness stand. I was just looking at the pictures of the long hairs up on the wall. I will let the witness tell about his asserted conversation with Mr. Rubin on the occasion described. Wine glass. What was that conversation at that time? And so ends and, and another end. episode of Chicago 7 Theater. I am Pimp Darnell. <laughs> Thank you, Judge Hunley. He, he's referring to the founding fathers that are in framed on the wall, all of them behind Judge Hoffman's uh, bench. Uh, as a, that's what Abby's uh, talking about. He then goes on to explain various um, uh, ideas of the founding fathers. But the fact that he's able to have this type of testimony on the record is amazing. And just impro improvisationally saying that is amazing in a court of law. And the judge was ripping his limited hair out at that point. So was so was Schultz and uh, Moran was the other prosecutor, um, I think, uh, who was at the bench with him. Yeah, yeah, the two of them. You almost have to feel sorry for them in some ways. Because, they, I mean, it's such a collision. They've never seen anything like it. And Well, just... okay, so it was their choice to take the heads of all these disparate uh, anti-war movements and try them together in a conspiracy as a group. Uh, clearly, they knew that a lot of these people had never even met each other, but they wanted to put the entire anti-war movement on trial. That was their choice. If they really, and we could discuss this with Barnes, Aviva, whatever, but if they really wanted to get them, they should have tried them individually. And But they wanted a media circus too. This is now the Nixon administration in 1969, Eric. This is no longer the LBJ administration. So it's now crossed over into 69, the trial. So um, Yeah, but it's still the Democratic machine, daily machine. Oh, oh in Chicago. Yeah, but yeah. this is the, the trial. It's well, This is a federal case, though, Eric. Oh, okay. This is federal court. So the, machi the machinery involved here is all uh, federal. I mean, the, hmm. the prosecutors are federal. The orders to do this are coming from, from the Department of Justice in, in Washington. Um, the cops who testify are kind of interesting because they break their um, role as as being infiltrators in the court. And the Bob Pearson one is very interesting because Ruben gets really upset that Pearson, who now shows up in a suit and tie, who was looking like a biker 
you know, when he was uh, protecting Ruben, um, now says exactly what happened or lies quite a bit, actually, under oath about what happened. Wow. Well, that was kind of interesting. But a- a- as he's uh, dealing with this, Abby begins to write a book. And the book is called Steal This Book. And mm. in that book, he urges every all of these free things are in the book. And that's it's when everybody bought this book or in my case, stole the book. If you could find it, you had it how to steal it because that's what Abby told you to do. So of course, nobody wanted to publish this book. This is, this is like, um, to, um, Chumba Wumba, um, tub thumping. I don't know if you remember that they had to lock it up under the counter because the band said to steal it. Oh, I don't know. I didn't know that, but, uh, yeah, this is the first time anybody ever done anything like this. And in this book, and Grogan got upset because a lot of this stuff came from the diggers. All this free stuff is in the book. How to get free meals, how to get free stuff. The blue box is in there, which, is, like I said to you, was from the phone freaks. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the phone freaks were selling the, the, the blue box. It was a black box, but the blue box was electronic signals you could hold up to the phone and get free phone calls around the world in a payphone. And the signals were designed by a, uh, an engineer who sold these boxes for 500 apiece. In 1970s money, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. Eric. So, I mean, Abby had one, and he it was, was worth like, it. Oh, no, I, was, I mean, if you were Abby Hoffman, it was worth it. it. Yeah, yeah, you could yeah. call anywhere in the world for hours using that. It had to be in a pay. Oh, I think it worked at home too. I don't think it was just completely a pay phone, so it may have been able to work on your home phone. I have to check that out. But the, the phone freaks later became the video freaks, and uh, they look. That was a separate story we'll get to. They live next door to us in Sonora House, the video video freaks. They were an extension of the phone freaks. But. And by the way, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were both phone freaks. Before right. Yeah. So Bobby this, and Apple this, and all this that. thing is did not happen in a bubble, did not go away in mm-hmm. a bubble. And was, you know, these people went on to do other things. But the 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 book itself begins to explain how you can get things for free in American society. And every kid in this country had that book. And most of the things still worked for years. For years, they still worked. Had to get free trips to Vegas, had to get free maps, you know, uh, free gas. You know, one of my favorites, which Abby does on the road himself, was he says, and I, well, when he goes on the road, when he goes underground, Abby has to live by steal this book. And a lot of that's covered in my, my screenplay of the film. Uh, Abby, where he has to live by the things in the book. Will that be on Locals later? Yeah, we'll put the script up on Locals um, Cool for members. But Abby, um, I had the book twice, got stolen twice. Well, okay, it went to a good cause. Good cause. So one of, the, one of my favorite things, and I tried all these things, too. We all tried them, was he said, when you're ever on the road, always have a bottle opener and a straw. <laughs> so when you got to a soda machine, the bottles were stacked up when you opened the door to the soda. Oh, machine. oh the sideways <laughs> bottles. Okay. Sideways. So you popped it off, stuck the straw in, drank out all the soda, hit the next one, drank out all the soda, and hit them all at, with the straw as quickly as possible. And you would pop the tops. So when you left, there would be six or eight empty Coke bottles with no tops on them and the straw was you were able to stick it in quickly and drink the soda oh, i did that one that worked beautifully <laughs> that really that was one of my favorite of, of the abbey ones uh, another favorite one of the book which i did to my mother was um you would mail a letter with no postage and you'd put your return address in the middle of the envelope and put the return address uh, where you wanted it sent so my mother didn't believe this so I wrote her a letter with no postage, and I put my address in the middle of the envelope right here in L.A., and I put her address in the return address at West Palm Beach with no stamp, and I wrote, I told you it worked, and she called me up four days later laughing. She got the return mail to West Palm Beach. That comes from Steal This Book. Oh, my that, God. That's what Abby came up with for the book, and there's thousands of them in there, thousands. <laughs> I mean, it, it, that oh, might still work today. There, there are quite a few of them. I mean, I have my copy here, but uh, obviously barely touched, barely touched. But I <laughs> put up on locals, on locals for members, a complete PDF of the book. 
Oh, nice. So you can actually go through it. Um, there's a, this is out of print, obviously, but I think it sells for about three or four hundred dollars. No, uh, I, 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 there's no, a reprint. Got it in print. Yeah, yeah. There's a reprint that came out, but the original, um, very expensive online. Very oh, expensive. Sure. So the PDF's up there. Uh, I, I encourage everyone to see what they could come up with, which still just w might just work. But the book comes out and that becomes another big uh, 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 fanfare for Abby, who in, obviously in 1969 decides to go to Woodstock because they're having a little gathering up there at Max Yasger's farm. So Abby tries to shake down um, the promoter's of the event um <laughs> my friend michael lang and michael lang the boy with uncle michael lang refuses to give money to abby who tries to get a hundred thousand dollars out of michael lang ends up with a table with um um literature on it but there is a photo i don't know if you have this photo it's a photo of Abby with Wavy Gravy and Paul Krasner, the three of them standing together. I don't know if you still have that photo, but it's at Woodstock. Mm. And Wavy Gravy's wearing a cowboy hat. Wavy Gravy, uh, George Romney, famously came from the West Coast and kind of invented granola. <laughs> he brought 10 million pounds of granola to Woodstock. I don't and have they, one. Uh, okay. Well, there's a great photo somewhere in the Huntley archives of Paul, <laughs> Paul Krasner abby it's a rare photo from my personal collection i'll put it up on locals i'll find it don't worry about it and and wavy gravy wavy gravy was an incredibly hysterical character uh, he had a pig farm and he brought his entire commune from oregon to uh the woodstock festival and they had an entire airplane that landed at jfk which is a separate episode um i can't get into wavy gravy here but abby was on, oh, there it is. Yeah, there's Wavy Gravy. That's it. Thank you. That's Paul Krasner, the editor of The Realist. Who Paul Krasner is, has to have his own episode as the editor of The Realist, also Lenny Bruce's best friend and Abby's best friend, crosses over multiple generations of the counterculture um, and was a friend of mine. Uh, passed away a couple of years ago in Palm Beach, uh, Palm Beach, Palm Springs here in uh, California. That's Abby in back of him there. And that was the walking stick of the toothless uh, Wavy Gravy. I don't know what happened to his teeth, but he ended up in my office at MTV where I paid him to write a piece for that Woodstock 2 edition of MTV. And <laughs> I was happy to pay him because uh, it was a pleasure to meet the guy. And uh, anyway, they're all on acid there. And Abby works his way up to the stage while the Who with Pete Townsend is tuning up or adjusting their amplifiers. And Abby. I think this is a pile of shit while John. Go ahead. You hearing it? Yeah, play the whole thing. It kind of got okay. cut off there. All right. I, I don't know if the sound is going through or not. No, it went through beautifully. Go ahead. Hold on. You can hear the. The pile of shit! While John Sinclair rots in prison. John Entwistle. John Entwistle. Okay. It's coming. Oh. I can dig it. Hold on for a second. Well, yeah, I can skip forward a little to it. No, no, no. It's fine the way it is. The what 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 Townsend does is he stabs him in the neck with his guitar, and Abby jumps off the front of the stage and runs underneath the stage. Now, what Townsend later said was that the stage is sacred, and he, should, he didn't want to hear any political bullshit on the stage, and that's his right to say that. And obviously, Abby was Abby. He didn't even know who he was, but. I mean, this was an event in New York State and Abby's home turf. You know, Townsend's coming from England. So whatever, Abby ran up and did it. But I mean, there's very little tolerance on the part of Townsend to, to embrace it. We have about 20 seconds left. It's coming. Oh, okay. Go ahead. When what you did you it. Yeah.
It was right after he did it. Okay. That's there. All right. Well, that's a British untold story. But getting back to America's untold stories. All right. But that bong was when he oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like the cut. So Abby jumps off the stage, blah, blah, blah. goes underneath the stage. And you say, well, what happens to Abby? Nobody knows what happens to Abby. Abby gets into my, <laughs> just a side story of America's untold story. Abby leaves the festival, goes into Monticello, where I was staying, and takes over Monticello Hospital, makes himself a doctor to treat the people on bad acid trips to help them. He, he just says, I am Dr. Hoffman. I am going to help the people who are having bad acid trips, which is what he does, which is exactly what he does. He helps talk down these people on bad acid trips. Now, thank you, Mike. Uh, oh, thanks, Mike. So, Abby leaves the festival, as I did every night, went back to Monticello. <laughs> so I was doing the same thing. But um, yeah, Pete Townsend then plays whatever he plays. And uh, I guess they became a popular group, the Who. You know, God knows what happened to them. But the reality one is... One of those British groups. You know, this, this is a little bit later. Yeah, but okay. So this is 1972. Uh, this is after uh, McGovern was trounced. This is on the rooftop of Abby's building on the Lower East Side where this other British fellow decides to share a joint with him. Because um, you got to understand, Abby was a rock star. Abby, I mean, Pete Townsend didn't know this, but Abby was bigger than Pete Townsend in America. It wasn't even close. I mean, John Lennon knows. I mean, because Lennon was political and Townsend wasn't. That's really mm. the answer there. I mean, John Lennon is involved in this because of John Sinclair. And that's what Abby is yelling about. John Sinclair was arrested as a political operative. He was framed in Michigan and was sentenced to 10 years. And then, <laughs> I don't know where you're getting this stuff. That's me with John Sinclair, obviously making a donation to the John Sinclair Fund. Uh, John Sinclair was the manager of the MC5, but he was also the founder of the... Go back for one second. I just want to see that picture again. The Yeah, so John Sinclair on the right was the founder of, uh, uh, of the White Panther Party, which was a radical uh, guerrilla group out of uh, Michigan. And he was a sax player on his own, but he managed the band, but it was really politics. I think John today is a judge, lives in Amsterdam, and he's a judge of the Cannabis Cup. Not, <laughs> not a criminal judge. He works for High Times as the Cannabis Judge. Okay, oh, you, can you can get rid of that. So Sinclair gets arrested for two joints, a sentence to 10 years. So Abby and his people get John Lennon to help out with a tour called the 10 for 2 tour that John Lennon did uh, and wrote a song called John Sinclair to help publicize Sinclair's plight. And, and Barnes would like this because it, it, it got publicity for this railroading of John Sinclair for 10 years for two joints. And John Sinclair was eventually released from prison. Um, and, it, you know, he was framed and they wanted him off the playing field in, in Michigan. And, 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 and Lenin was part of that. And then Lenin was targeted by the Nixon administration, which you can see in the documentary, the United States versus John Lennon, um, where they try to get him deported because he was busted for pot. So the pot bus were used as political weapons is what I was getting at. Still are. Or, well, yeah, until well, recently. Not anymore. Until recently, right. Yeah. So Lennon smoking that joint with Abby was about John Sinclair and the 10 for 2 tour. And Abby was trying to use and successfully did use uh, rock and roll, which is what he wanted Michael Lang. To, the reason I'm telling this is what he wanted Michael Lang to do with Woodstock. And Lang was not having it. Because Lang was what Abby called these hip capitalists who wanted to make money while wearing bell bottoms and shit. Like Lang was not a political person. And, you know, I knew Lang or whatever, but he wasn't like a heavyweight political guy. You know, he was a guy who wanted to make money, you know, and, and that's OK. You know what I mean? But Abby was trying to do back then in 69 what he did with with John Lennon in 70 and 71, which was to help get Sinclair out of jail. And that's why he went up there and said, this is a pile of shit while John Sinclair rots in prison. A perfectly legitimate political statement that needed explaining because it's now in the Who box set. And I don't think there's enough explanation in that Who bo box set like I'm telling you today. And this is, you know, me telling you what, what the background of this story is for that purpose, because people know who the Who are and they don't know who Abby Hoffman is, you know. 
But that being said, there was a reason for Abby doing that. Awesome, man. We got a couple super chats in here. Um, Rolf, our trustee in Norwegian, used to see Wavy Gravy at two dollar name band concerts. Right. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. And, and, and uh, Australia, absolutely oh, fabulous. Sure. No, I don't think Thank it's you. Australia. I think it's Tans Tasmania. Right, but uh, it's Australian fourteen ninety nine. <laughs> Okay. Or Australian dollars. So right, right. But thank you very much, son. Um, right. I thank guess you. it's Sanchia. Thank you. thank you. The um okay, so the situation becomes um in 1970. I don't know if you have a picture of this. Grace Slick, who was real oh yeah, there, there it is. She looks like Joey Ramone in this picture, but <laughs> he, her real name was Grace Wing, and she went to I think it was called Finch College. And Finch College was having a reunion or a tea party at the White House because Tricia Nixon had been a graduate of Finch College. So they invited this sorority from <laughs> this college to, yeah, yeah, here they are showing up. And that's Abby and Grace Slick on the right. Now, Grace Slick has on her about six milligrams of pure LSD. And her plan is. And this to is Jefferson Airplane Grace. This is right. Grace Slate, the lead singer. One pill makes you larger. One pill okay. makes you small. Just in go case ask, people didn't know. <laughs> go ask Alice. And um, she has a powdered LSD on her. And her plan is to put it in her fingernail and drop it into the teacup of one Richard Milhouse Nixon, oh, thereby man. having him tripping and altering the. Uh, 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 the war itself in Vietnam, he'll be exposed to LSD and that would help him become lysergic. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. That was the same damn plot as the CIA wanted to do to Castro. Um, Ironically. One of the plots they wanted right, to do. Right, sure, but right. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's right. interesting. I, it's definitely interesting. So she brings Abby as her date. So mm. Abby slicks back his hair and he puts on his suit and tie but he's immediately again recognized as abby hoffman nobody recognizes grace slick so they get stopped at the gate which is this is the gate of the white house and they're prevented from going into the tea party where at a minimum grace slick would have dosed the punch yeah it, it, they actually cover this as an article uh i don't know great cleaned up hoffman tries to crash white house party um Mom, ma, bomb mail to White House. It's not him. I think that's the weather underground. That's no. a separate story. But you see Abby with Grace Slick there, um, and I think uh, the backup plan was to was to dose the punch. That <laughs> they would have dosed the punch, and that would have led to a bunch of Finch girls tripping on acid, which would have been, you know, a different political statement. Uh, you think? <laughs> I think so. But again, the, these are all these different things. That, you know. He begins to um, get involved in different situations, uh, Nicaragua and, and, and you know, the, the, the 1969 um, comes to an end and he's still his book is out. And the thing with him smoking that joint with Lenin was important because it was on the roof after Walter Mondale lost 49 states. Yeah. This was the election night party, I think. They not, had. not Mondale. That was Reagan. No, I think uh, no, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, McGovern? McGovern. Yes, I'm sorry. McGovern. When McGovern lost, did he lose 49 states? Or he lost a lot. I think I think it was Mondale who lost 49, except for like Wisconsin. McGovern must have lost 48 then. He lost a lot, yeah. It's a landslide. Anyway, the, the left blamed Hoffman for this. And they accused him of... of creating a climate that was so radical. Uh, these were liberals I'm talking about, not the not the extreme leftists, but the liberals blamed Hoffman for this debacle and the election uh, of Nixon and the re-election. And they, 49. It was 49 states, right. Mm -hmm. the, 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 he took the blame for this. And he begins to um, get super depressed over uh, politics. And in fact, a lot of his work dries up. Nobody wants to uh, deal with him. The, they're all depressed. People begin to do other things. Uh, Rennie Davis becomes a disciple of uh, a guru in India. 
uh, Jerry Rubin becomes a yuppie. Uh, all of these people from the Chicago 7, all of these people begin to move on with their lives. Disco begins to happen. The entire culture, well, this is much later in the show. We'll get okay. to this a lot later, but... Um, I don't know if they were related or not. Sorry. No, 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 no. They're not. But the, what I'm saying is that people get, start doing different things. And Abby is broke. He's got two. He's got kids in Massachusetts. He's got a kid with Anita. He has no money. He got divorced. Uh, he's got child support payments to make, and he and he has no no income. So he begins to hang out on the Hamp in the Hamptons, and he begins to get into cocaine. And this leads to him selling cocaine, um, but you know, selling cocaine to his friends, really. You know what I mean? Selling <laughs> cocaine and moving cocaine and, you know, people were selling pot and selling cocaine. It wasn't a big deal. But here's where it gets interesting. Abby wants to make one massive cocaine deal and get a ton of money so he can escape and pay off his debts, pay his wives, Get, take the child support uh, burden off of his back and go to go to Europe and live it, you know, live out his life and, and do whatever he wants to do. Yeah, it's always, it's always that one last score, though. Isn't that the plot yeah, of yeah. every freaking movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he decides to um, sell three pounds of cocaine to the mob and the mobsters. Uh, he says, I'm going to step on this cocaine and really screw them. And they're going, Abby, they'll kill you. And he's acting out. He's acting out more and more. And the people are telling him, you're really too famous to be doing cocaine sales at this level. The closest thing I could think of uh, about cocaine sales visually is if someone is strikingly uh, in appearance as Geraldo Rivera was selling you cocaine. If that, mm. if that resonates with anybody. That's sure. how famous Geraldo was and Abby was. You know what I mean? The idea of Geraldo Rivera showing up at your house selling you cocaine might be noticed. And they were trying to tell Abby this, but he was desperate and he was crazy and he was hyper and he was manic. And he they had just passed the Rockefeller laws that week. The Rockefeller law was a law designed to put you in jail for selling X amount of weight of cocaine for 15 years to life. And Abby said, fuck it. Somebody's got to challenge the law not knowing he was going to get arrested or anything, but he brazenly said this law is unconstitutional and eventually someone's going to contest it. Well, the very next day after that statement, Abby went with a couple of kids to the Diplomat Hotel on West 43rd Street. And he went up to a room in the, in the hotel and he took um, a, over a kilo of cocaine into that room to sell it to the mob. Well, the mob turned out to be a guy named Nascarella. Now, Nas Arthur Nascarella uh, was an undercover New York City narcotics detective. And he was hip to this coming down and he busted Abby and they dragged him out in handcuffs. And Abby was stunned and they took him away to the tombs. And he was it was all over the papers. It was the biggest story in America. Abby hmm. Hoffman, radical leftist leader, arrested for selling uh, three pounds of cocaine to undercover narcotics officers. I don't know if we have any photos or footage there uh, of anything related to that. Um, uh, it, not the bus. No, I don't believe Nothing so. on the bus? No. No, I don't have anything on the bus. Sorry. Okay. So he's taken to the tombs where he's put into the tombs and he's um, in there for weeks. Um, I think he was in there for six weeks. And they um, have a bail fundraising party with celebrities, Norman Mailer, um, all these different people raise money to get Abby out on bail. And he's looking at life imprisonment. And I mean, this was not a guy just selling a gram in a bar. Um, this is a guy selling weight. And they had him dead to rights. They had wires. They had wiretapped um, the people. They had everything. You could, it was like a perfect drug bust. If there ever was a perfect drug bust, he walked into it. <laughs> they were tracking. They were tracking it for weeks. They were tracking before it happened, Eric. They were. They knew this was coming down for weeks, because they were uh, uh, involved in in tracing this uh, cocaine. And they had a guy mm -hmm. with them who was a kid from Queens who was making believe he was an Italian mobster. Nascarella poses as an Italian mobster. Um, turned out that the cocaine was seventeen percent pure. By the way, 
um, which you could later make an argument, and we could ask Barnes about the purity of drugs in relations to uh, arrests. You know what I mean? There's some uh, history of um, people getting off based on the purity. Of, uh, you know, in other words, if the cocaine is 17% cocaine, is it really a kilo and a half of cocaine? Okay. <laughs> it's still enough for a percentage. But yeah, yeah. No, no, but I'm saying that has gotten people off historically before, hmm. you know, or at least it's a legal argument. Uh, but anyway, so, so step down the sentence like the cocaine is what you're saying. Yeah, I, I mean, in, what's <laughs> the idea? look, Your Honor, I'm just I'm here as a as a witness. I'm but the victim. I'm, I'm the supposed victim. to have pure cocaine. Now, look yeah. at this. Yeah, you can't try me. But you Abby steps to... on it heavily, saying he's going to screw the mob. But I mean, they could have killed him. They, you know, he he pats the guy down. And Nascarello's got a 38 on him on his shoulder holster. And he goes, you got a gun? He goes, of course I got a gun. He <laughs> goes, I'm a mobster. That's why I got it. You don't have a gun? Abby goes, no. He goes, you're an idiot. <laughs> he tells him this when he goes Pretty into much. the hotel room. You know, so Abby is now in the tombs. He gets out on bail. They have this bail raising party. And um, he tells Anita, his wife who, and his son, America. His, by the way, his son is named America with a small A and a K. Um, who's, uh, you know, now older and still, I don't think he uses the name America any longer, but I, maybe he does. I don't know. But anyway, so Abby says to Anita, I can't do life imprisonment on this. They're trying to set me up. They're going to put me away for life, which is true, which, but he, he's guilty. I mean, there's no defense really. I mean, there's now a, a law in the books about the Rockefeller laws and Abby decides to jump bail. And, um, He's going to have a tough time jumping bail because he's the most famous looking guy in America. It's like Geraldo Rivera jumping bail. You know what I mean? Or, or, or Jay Leno. You know what I mean? Like, aren't you Jay Leno? No, no, no. Sure. I'm not. I, I'm not Jay Leno. I, what are you talking about? I'm not Jay Leno. Anyway, so he jumps bail and he starts to go underground and he goes to Mexico, um, of all places, and goes to a small village in Mexico and begins to uh, live there. He goes back to L.A. Um, and he has, from Mexico, he goes back to L.A. and he has plastic surgery on his nose uh, to alter his look. He has, he takes Berlitz language courses to learn Spanish. He takes karate classes to alter his gait. He takes, um, uh, uh, goes to the Max Factor School. Sounds like um, James Earl Ray. Yeah, no, no, it's very similar. Very similar. He goes to Max Factor's School of Makeup in Hollywood uh, right over here to learn how to do makeup, hair and makeup. And he, he's living now on his wits and steal this book. He, he, he's a really good cook and he gets a job as a chef in these Mexican restaurants. Um, I'll give you an example of one of the things he does by steal this book. He, he obviously is using the blue box for phone calls. Mm -hmm. But he takes a, um, a dollar bill, photostats it, and glues both sides together, right? And the photostats, and he cuts them out, and he goes to the laundromat, and he keeps putting them into the changer. And like a jackpot in Vegas, four quarters keep coming out. And these are photostats of a dollar bill, Eric, fronts and backs glued together. And that's giving him money out of the changer in the laundromat until they're empty. Wow. Which is pretty cool. And then on the road, he would go to the hospital and he would say, "What do you have a string though to pull it back out?" No, 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 no. Out? That one went in. He just made. He just had a bunch oh, of more copies. Okay. He had a bunch of copies. Yeah, that's all. They were copies. They were black and white. Good guy. And it, it didn't wasn't able to delineate, so it put out the four quarters every time. So he then went to the hospitals, various hospitals, and he would say, "I'd like to sell my body after my demise for science," <laughs> and they would give you an honorarium for donating your body to science. And he went from hospital to hospital, getting hundreds of dollars selling his body to hospitals for, for med students. Oh my God. I mean, he, he had so many scams. He had multiple IDs. He would you know find out uh, about a kid that died in infancy, then come on, he, would be, he was Barry Freed. He had a bunch of different IDs and passports and stuff like that. But he meets this chick, Joanna Lawrenson, who was, used to be a supermodel, who was a friend of Viva, um, not Viva up in Montreal, Viva, the Warhol supermodel Viva, uh, the original Viva. She's friends with her. And uh, Joanna Lawrenson is in Mexico and she meets Abby and they become lovers and she eventually becomes his third wife. Uh, Joanna Lawrence's family goes all the way back to the American Revolution. 
uh, her relatives were daughters of the American Revolution, blah, blah, blah. Uh, her mother wrote Latin as a lousy lovers. Her mother was a famous author, blah, blah, blah. So they meet up in Mexico City and they begin this relationship down there. And Abby begins to lose his mind. He can't take it anymore. You know what I mean? Being in Mexico City, they go to Vegas. He has a nervous breakdown in Vegas. He starts running through the casino yelling, I'm Abby Hoffman, I'm Abby Hoffman. They tackle him. They bring him back to the room. They <laughs> tie him up. He, you know, he's screaming, I'm Abby Hoffman in the room. And there's a knock on the door. Everyone freezes. And it's a guy, an old man in a bathrobe. And he says, I am Larry Cohen. I am next door. Will you shut the F up? <laughs> <laughs> it was a guest in the next room named Cohen. Anyway, so he's he's in the underground and he's trying to survive down there, but he's getting crazier and crazier because he's now living under this pseudonym uh, and this phony life. And every once in a while, somebody would say, are you Abby? And he'd go, no, I'm not. You know, uh, he, he put on a phony accent, you know. So when he meets Johanna Lawrence and he tells her that she's got a home She's got a home in Fineview on Wellesley Island in the St. Lawrence River up by Canada. It's the most northern part of New York State. Uh, it's an island in the Thousand Islands called Wellesley Island. And it's in a town called Fineview. And, and it's right on the water. And they move there together. And he gets a speedboat. And he has the speedboat so he can escape to Canada if they're closing in on America, you know what I mean? And he says his name is Barry Freed, that he's a freelance TV writer. She says who she is, which is John Lawrence in a former fashion model. Uh, now we'll hold off on that for a couple of seconds. Hold on. Oh, okay, Barry we'll get to Freed. that. We'll get to that. The, the Barry Freed just begins a new life in Wellesley Island. And here's the backstory on this. The FBI, has him on the 10 most wanted list, right? Mm -hmm. They take a guy who grew up with him in Worcester Masters in the FBI, one of his best friends. And his best friend has been tracking him for the FBI, unbeknownst to him. A guy he used to play hoops with, a guy he went to school with, a guy who became an FBI agent who was also Jewish and was the guy assigned to bring in Hoffman from the 10 most wanted list of the FBI. At the, they had 100 different agents assigned to track him down. His father passed away. They had 50 agents at the funeral. He couldn't go to the funeral. They had everybody wiretapped. And while he's on the run, he begins to write articles on the run for Playboy, for We, for Penthouse, uh, for all these different magazines. He begins to publish articles for Income, Eric, as a freelance writer. And <laughs> they're for all these different publications. And he goes somehow... They had a network for him to mail in these articles through a series of cutouts. He would get the articles mailed to Rolling Stone. They would publish an article. Crawdaddy Magazine, Cream, Playboy, Penthouse, We, all of these magazines would publish articles by Abby Hoffman. And he would get money from this. So he somehow was able to get a piece of stationery from Playboy, blank stationery, right? So he made himself the food critic of Playboy Magazine, okay? Mm -hmm. And then he, with Johanna, he flew to Paris and he went around to the top restaurants in Paris showing this letter and eating for free at five star restaurants in Paris while on the run from the FBI. Mm -hmm. So he flies back to New York, goes back up there and he's living up there, uh, you know, generating this income from freelance articles. But it's really not enough to satisfy him politically. Remember the no nukes movement with Jackson Brown and all this stuff? Remember when they were the whole no nukes thing was mm -hmm. happening? Well, he can't even be part of that. And he's really gone crazy. But when he was in New York, he went on the Merv Griffin show, just to backtrack for one side story. And he wore something called the American flag shirt. I don't know if you have a picture of him with this American flag shirt that he got arrested for. Well, it's in the thumbnail, but... Um... Oh, yeah, there it is. There's the shirt, right. Um, okay, so he went on the Merv Griffin show wearing this shirt, and they blacked him out like they did to Elvis Presley on the... on the um, When Elvis Presley was on uh, moving his lower body parts on some TV shows. They blocked out uh, uh, Abby Hoffman, 
And Abby Hoffman pointed out in court that Roy Rogers and Dale Evans had the same shirt and the case was thrown out. But the reason I mention this is he puts this shirt on in Wellesley Island in fine view. And, and it's like putting on your old baseball uniform and it doesn't fit. Right. Crazy. So the reality of it is he begins to ache to do something. Mm -hmm. And a guy comes by and says, look at this manual. And it's a manual that says the St. Lawrence River, the islands are going to be blown up by the Army Corps of Engineers. And he begins to realize that he's got to do something to save the Thousand Islands. And that something is going to lead to his arrest and capture. And what he does is he organizes the town to take on the Army Corps of Engineers to prevent them from blowing up the Thousand Islands. And hmm. in doing that, he knows that it's going to lead to his arrest and it's redemption of him for the coke uh, for the coke bust because he had so much shame for the cocaine bust that this was his spiritual redemption leading to his arrest and it goes so far as to have him testify in Washington before Senator Moynihan's commission which if you could show that photo that's Senator Patrick Daniel Moynihan. That's Abby Hoffman as Barry Freed on the 10 most wanted list of the FBI testifying in Congress as Barry Freed to prevent the Army Corps of Engineers from blowing up the Thousand Islands to navigate for winter uh, 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 barges to go through in the winter uh, to make it wide enough for oil barges to go through the St. Lawrence River Seaway. Daniel Moynihan commissioned agrees with him and gives Barry an award. And he goes up to the St. Lawrence River and he says, I always wondered what happened to the 1960s. Barry Freed is the 1960s. And Abby is scared to death and Johanna is scared to death. And there's a guy who's pulling up on a speedboat in the island at that time. And that's the FBI agent who's coming after him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's who's coming after him. And Abby realizes that he may get shot or killed and decides to turn himself in to the government at that point. And that's 1980, September 4th, 1980. And to turn himself in, he contacts Barbara Walters of 2020, who comes up to Wellesley Island in her own riverboat with a crew. And that begins the interview of Abby Hoffman, which is an episode on 2020. And the next day he surrenders to the authorities in New York. By the way, we'll be putting that up on Locals. The, the right, that episode's episode. incredible. It'll go over the, the story, the underground story of Abby, mm -hmm. mostly in that, in that episode. But Abby turns himself in, and he is sentenced to a year in Fishkill uh, 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 Federal, uh, minimum security federal prison, just about four mm -hmm. months. He gets out and then later, um, you know, begins to go on onto tours of campuses hooks up with a girl named Amy Carter, who you see, who's actually pretty cute there, Eric. I don't know what they're talking about. That's Abby with Amy Carter, President Carter's daughter. And she was going to the University of Massachusetts and they were arrested for trespassing on the University of Massachusetts in a protest against the CIA recruiting students on campus. And Abby and her teamed up with a couple of other defendants and put the CIA on trial in this court case. And the jury agreed with them and Abby and her won the case against the Central Intelligence Agency recruiting on America's campuses. Um, and it was a strange bedfellows case, but um, that was in the 80s. That was 1986, I think. Yeah, 1986. But Abby, and just to wrap this up, Abby was... Um, diagnosed with manic depression and he hated being on lithium because it took away his manic energy, which a lot of people who are bipolar attest to. And Abby spiraled into a series of suicide attempts, not one or two, I think there might've been a couple more, um, and was super depressed. He was living in a, in a place in, 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 in Pennsylvania. Um, and he took 150, uh, phenobarbitols, drank a gallon of vodka and committed suicide. And this was two days before this, I guess he was planning his suicide. Uh, two days before this, 
he spoke at Vanderbilt University, and those are his final words two days before his death. Um, you could read them, and it speaks for itself, I think. You know, his, um, yeah, it was pretty heavy. So that was the end of Abby Hoffman, but really not because his, his legend, um, he had the cover of People magazine. Yeah, you know, I mean, these people were arrested in another occupation of a, of a, of a, college uh, about the CIA and they were being dragged out of the basement and one by one they were asked their names by the police and there was about 60 students in there and each one of them said their name was Abby Hoffman and that was a testament to Abby Hoffman um, he was a maniac and um, he was political he was you know he he was never a communist but he was an American original and on his death certificate I don't know how it got there. It must have come from his brother, Jack. It had his occupation on his death certificate, and his occupation was Jewish road warrior. <laughs> on the, yeah. On the death certificate. Yeah. Well, so, sure. yeah, I mean, I, I suggest reading um, uh, Steal This Dream by by Larry Ratzo Sloman. Uh, there's another book called American Rebel by Marty Jazer. There's Abby's books, of course, Woodstock Nation, Steal This Book, and... Um, um, a number of other good books on Abby, but those are probably the best. Oh yeah, and soon to be a major motion picture, which was written by Abby uh, when he was underground. There's Woodstock Nation, that's obviously in the 60s, steal this book in 72. That's the Brett Morgan um, film. I highly recommend that. That's the book, uh, Revolution for the Hell of It, uh, by Free, because he was under contract with, an, with another company, so he wrote it as Free to avoid uh, contract, contract issues, but um, yeah, it's an amazing story. Um, and an America's untold story, you know, I mean, th this guy's an American original came out of a blue collar family in Massachusetts and, um, you know, he made a name for himself and he changed a lot of, a lot of people's perception, uh, of, of the fact that you could take millions of people, you know, and send them to war to fight a, a war that nobody wanted at that point. Um, he, he made us, he made a mark on his culture. Yeah, he did. And on that note to close out we have a final little clip of 2020 when they're introducing it oh, and right. you can okay, see cool. him on the boat cool. meeting uh barbara Wall. oh yeah watch this this is great this if is you guys like great. this throw us a like yeah consider subscribing and PayPal definitely check out locals PayPal. don't forget PayPal. PayPal. yep locals. And, uh, well we, we're gonna be putting stuff up on locals yeah, yeah, yeah. In this definitely. entire episode definitely uh, from 2020 sometime tonight or tomorrow it, it'll be up there everybody thank you so much and see you for baldwin next tuesday oh yeah that's right hoffman was indicted on the drug charge in 1973 he was held in jail six months and then released on bail he went into hiding here is barbara walters with the story of abby hoffman since then barbara well hugh i i haven't had such elaborate security precautions since an interview i did with plo leader yasser arafat in this case, Abby arranged the whole thing. We had no idea where we were going. A chartered plane brought us to the banks of the St. Lawrence River in a remote area of upstate New York known as the Thousand Islands. Then a high speedboat ride to an even more secluded spot. Suddenly, another speedboat appeared, driven by a beautiful woman. Hi. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Barry. Good to see you. Welcome to America. <laughs> Thank you.